great lyricist there. Of course, he also wrote Only the Good Die Young, which is you know, not particularly friendly to Catholics. <laughs> Anyhow, um, all right, as some of you know, I'm recovering from a pretty bad migraine today. Uh, most of the pain is over, uh, but I'm still a little bit loopy, either from the after effects of the migraine or of the drugs. Uh, it's complicated by the fact that today I was going to spend some time getting my lecture ready for tonight, and it interfered with that. So bottom line, I take no responsibility for anything that comes out of my mouth tonight. <laughs> it's going to be very rambling. So uh, uh, as Mr. Darlin might say to Andrew Griffith, jump in where you can and hang on. How am, I, how am I doing there? Good? Yeah, all right. So, Y'all TV land? I'm not right tonight. This means you. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, well, two weeks ago, uh, Father David was talking about uh, the incarnation of Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. So this is uh, sort of the sequel to that. Uh, specifically uh, chapter 8, which once again I assume that you have read. Uh, why, why did Christ have to die on the cross? What did that accomplish? What did that achieve? What was going on? Uh, the, probably the one word answer, which I will start tonight, is the word atonement. And you all have all probably heard that word. Um, it's actually one of the few theological terms in Christianity that is actually English in origin. It's a concatenation of, I love that concatenation, I'm not good. Uh, it's, a, it's a concatenation of the two words at one, to be at one with, to be in harmony with. So in that sense, atonement uh, is related, if you think about it, to communion. Because what does communion mean? To be in union with. And that really leads us to one of the very first uh, statements you find, good succinct statements. I think it was a St. Augustine who said this uh, as to why Christ uh, became incarnate and was made man. Uh, God became man so that man might become God. Now, that's a little bit l too literate at the end. We are certainly not going to become God ourselves, but we certainly are going to share in the divine life once we have, uh, once our sins have been atoned for and once we are in communion with God and each other. And th God chose to do that by becoming a human being uh, fully and completely. And just raise your hand and ask if you've got any questions as I go along. So let's look at that in the context uh, of Jewish history. Uh, because one thing you, you do need to understand uh, that despite how bad the Christian world has been to the Jewish world uh, at times throughout history, uh, you have to understand that that's, that's not Catholic doctrine. That is a failure of Catholics to live up to the truth of the gospel. The truth is that Catholicism is the completion, the fulfillment of Judaism. Judaism is the foreshadowing of Christianity. So uh, you have to understand Judaism if you're going to understand Christianity. And one of the first things you understand is that from the beginning of Genesis, from the beginning of the fall, something's not right. Something is fundamentally flawed. It's broken. It's diseased. It's evil in human nature. Now, that's not to say human nature itself is completely evil. Uh, we were made in the image of God. Uh, let us make man in our image, imago Dei. And we are still made in God's image. Uh, but it's a twisted, perverted image today because of original sin. Uh, it affects all of us like some sort of inherited disease. It's like looking into a funhouse mirror and seeing yourself. You're not seeing the true image of God. You're seeing, you, you can still see the image there, but it's messed up. Uh, and it's capable of some pretty terrible things. And uh, the Jewish faith understands that and from the beginning realized that that had to be fixed. It had to be repaired somehow. And 
since there was some sort of offense committed against God. God said, don't do that or you're going to die. You're going to be cut off from me. That's what die means. Uh, somebody's got to pay a penalty. Somebody's got to pay a sacrifice to try to make things right. And you see that uh, with the offerings of Cain and Abel. Uh, and, uh, and Abel's sacrifice was a bloody sacrifice. And you see throughout Jewish history uh, the spilling of blood, the sacrificing of blood, the inflicting of pain and death on something to try to stand in for the damage that we have done. So, uh, and, and also to personal cost. Uh, you've, you've, got a, you've got a cow here, you've got uh, chickens, you've got birds or something. I mean, that's a source of protein. That's money. That's value. Well, instead of keeping it and using it to feed your family, you kill it and you burn it all up. So that's a sacrifice to you. Uh, so it, it costs. You want to go your own way. You want to separate yourself from God. And then you realize that that is not good for you. You want to come back. It's going to cost somebody something to try to repair this damage. Because God is infinitely just. Uh, today the, the talk tends to be a lot about God's mercy. Uh, and we want God to be infinitely merciful, especially to us. We don't necessarily want him to be infinitely merciful to our enemies. That's different, he said facetiously. We want him to be very merciful to us. We want God to be infinitely just to our enemies. But he's both. He's both. Uh, you, you want a just God. And that's what you've got. And therefore, how is God's infinite justice satisfied? Well, somehow through the life, teachings, death, and resurrection of Christ. And so that's where we're headed today. Um, in the Old Testament, you see a series of covenants. Uh, you see God speaking to his people, the Hebrews. And a covenant is sort of like a contract, but not quite. It's not just an exchange of goods or services. It's actually uh, more solemn than that, more sacred. It's, uh, in biblical terms, an exchange of persons. You will be my people. I will be your God. We will be at one. We will be in communion. Uh, but how is that carried out? Well, there's, there's a series of covenants. And these covenants essentially are about God calling his people to repentance calling his people into some sort of relationship with him. You do this and then I'll do that. And the Hebrews will usually joyfully say, yes, that's great. It's a good deal for us and we're back in your graces and that's wonderful. So they agree to the covenant and then they end up breaking it again. And that, that begins from the very beginning. You know, God says, here's everything, here's the garden, just don't eat that. And they say, fine, cool, groovy. Then as soon as they don't think God's looking, yeah. uh, God sends Moses. And he, well, actually, Abra the Abrahamic covenant comes first. And then Moses. And there's always a new covenant. And the covenants tend to expand. First of all, with the family. Uh, then with the tribe. Then with the, uh, or the clan, rather. Then with the extended clan called the tribe. Then with the nations of Israel. So the covenants get bigger and bigger. Uh, as God reaches out to more and more people. But the constant is that the people he covenants with always screw it up. They can't keep the covenant. They cannot live in God's grace. And so, in the end, the last covenant, which is referred to in Christianity as the New Covenant, the New Testament, uh, the one that God makes with all people everywhere, it's like God goes... You know, if you want something done right, you've got to do it yourself. I'll become human and I'll keep the covenant. And I'll keep it perfectly. I will do it on behalf of fallen humanity who can't seem to get it right because of their sinful natures. And hence, you have Christ Jesus, uh, who is 100% fully, completely human. He is also 100% fully, completely divine. And... If you took away anything from Father David's talk a couple of weeks ago, that should be the thing. That you don't have two people crammed into this one shell. You don't have half human, half God. You don't have a human who was adopted by God. You don't have God who is an astral holographic 
projection of a human. You know, he's completely, totally human, except for sin. And he's also completely, totally God. And it doesn't make sense, so don't try to figure it out. You just have to accept it, uh, because we can't figure it out, beyond our comprehension. Um, so, something about Christ brings about this atonement, brings about this reconciliation, brings about this communion. But what? Well, this is another thing you don't want to think too hard about. Uh, I, I can offer you some ideas, general thoughts, uh, but you, you don't want to get too caught up in the reason because, once again, it's, it, it's really beyond human comprehension. Uh, there are two or three different broad categories of how Christ achieved this. Uh, and two of them especially focus on his passion and death. Uh, probably the earliest is the idea that just by virtue of the fact that he took human flesh and shared our nature, that somehow did it. Especially that he showed us how to believe, how to behave, how to think, how to do. Um, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Uh, that Jesus being God, Jesus being Jewish, meant that he could and therefore did perfectly observe the Jewish law. Perfectly. He gave us an example of, of how to live the Christian life. Uh, but is that enough? Uh, is that enough? Especially since we still don't do it, even though we've got that perfect example there. There's got to be something more. Uh, another theory that emerges pretty, on, pretty early on is, uh, is often referred to as the, the ransom theory or the Christus Victor theory. Uh, and this is the one that really starts focusing in on Christ's passion and death. Uh, and it's a, it's a brutal death. It's a death that he freely accepted. You see him telling his uh, disciples this over and over again. I mean, right after Jesus names Peter the first pope, you know, here are the keys. Uh, and then he starts telling Peter and the other disciples, well, the, the plan is this. I'm going to go to Jerusalem and get myself killed. And Peter says, no, I'm not going to let you do that. What does Jesus say to his first pope? Get behind me, Satan. You know, it, I've told you what the plan is. You know, this, this has got to be done. And the word Satan... Uh, comes from the Hebrew uh, asehan, that uh, essentially it's a Bedouin word that essentially means the adversary. So Jesus is telling Peter, don't get in my way about this. This has got to happen. And you see this emphasized over and over again that Jesus is freely accepting uh, this fate. And so what is it about this fate? Well, there are a lot of things about it. Uh, the Last Supper is apparently, there, there are a couple of question marks with this, because the different Gospels, I think it's John's Gospel, puts it at a, uh, the day before the Passover, actually. But it's generally accepted as being a Passover Seder. And what is the Passover Seder? It is the uh, remembering or the reenacting of the original Passover that took place in Egypt during the Exodus, when the Hebrews were enslaved by Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Uh, and how well do we remember the, the Passover story? That, that Moses showed up, he told Pharaoh, uh, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. Pharaoh won't do it. And so God then afflicts the Egyptians with all of these plagues. The last one is, is the Passover. That uh, the angel of death passes through, passes over the land, or passes through the land. And the firstborn sons of all the Egyptians are killed. But not the Hebrews. If they do what? If they slaughter a lamb, it's got to be a good lamb, it's got to be a lamb without blemish, uh, they roast the lamb, they eat the lamb, they, they take a sprig of hyssop, they splash its blood over the doorposts and the lentil, to, to show the angel that this is what they've done. I mean, this is a, this is a bloody mess. I mean, don't think sin is, is, a, is a light thing. It's a horrible, bloody, terrible thing. And it's going to require some sort of blood propitiation. And this is a way whereby 
the Hebrews are going to, to enter into God's covenant. The angel will pass over uh, their houses and not demand the lives of their firstborn sons. And so thereafter, every year, the Hebrews celebrate the Passover. So that's what's going on in the upper room uh, with Jesus the night before his death on the cross. Now, there's some interesting things going on in this. Um, I, I, I'm not as familiar with Passover Seders as I should be, and I'm nicking some of this from Scott Hahn, a name that some of you will remember. But as I understand it, and if anybody here knows about Seders, please correct me or jump in. Uh, I understand that there are four cups that everyone partakes of during the Seder. And I can't even remember the name of them. There was one before, and then the cup of blessing, and then, an, then after that, the recitation of the 113th Psalm, and then a third cup, and after that you have the uh, recitation of the Hillel prayers. Uh, at some point you have the Barak prayer, uh, which is the prayer of recalling your, uh, your role as, as part of the story of uh, the Hebrews and being redeemed by God. Yes. Yes. What is Seder? Seder is, I don't know the actual etymology of the term, but it's, it's the reenacting of the Passover every year. Uh, so, yes, it's a very, it's a very important moment in, in Jewish life. And, and it takes place around the time of Easter uh, in the Hebrew month of Nisan. Uh, varies a little bit. It, you know, it's not exactly at Easter time because we have different calendars, but about the same time, Passover's in the spring. And then you have the fourth cup, which is really the climax of the Seder, uh, uh, following which whoever's presiding, the rabbi or the head of the family, pronounces that uh, God's saving work has been accomplished, that the Passover Seder is finished uh, for another year. Well, if you look at what's going on in the upper room, you can count the cups. There are three cups. And the third cup is when Christ says, this is the cup of my blood, uh, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant should be shed for you and for many for forgiveness of sins. Do this as oft as you shall drink it in memory of me. Uh, there's several things going on there. Uh, one is, he says, do this in memory of me. So you've got that Baraka prayer going on, and I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, but it's recalling you know, the, mem the memorializing of what's going on, just as the Seder is the memorializing of the original Passover. Uh, then they sing some hymns, which are probably the Hillel Psalms. Uh, we don't know that for certain, but that's the best guess, since it seems to be a Passover. And then they get up and they go out into the garden. And the meal is over. Now, is there a problem with this? How many cups have there been? Three. Only three. Uh, I mean, that completely screws up the liturgy, if you will, of the Passover Seder. It's like you come to Mass here, and, and everybody has been to Mass, even though you're not Catholic, I imagine you've been to Mass a few times. Uh, it's like we, we're, we're doing great, you know, we've read the Gospel, we've, we've had the sermon, we've fallen asleep at Father McDonald's. Oh, I'm sorry, Father McDonald, did I say that? Oh, me. Uh, uh, we, we have the homily, and uh, you know, the, the gifts are brought up, and the wine is brought, and the bread is brought, and he, Father McDonald begins the Eucharistic prayer, and then just before he gets to the words of consecration, he says, that's all, bye, and he goes on back and leaves. Do you see the problem? This is, this is a huge omission. Where did the fourth cup go? Well, if you follow it uh, down to the, uh, to the crucifixion the next day, and in one gospel account, Christ refuses a cup of wine in Gaul. He then takes some sour wine on a hyssop branch. Hmm, where did I hear about hyssop? Uh, just a few minutes ago. That this blood was put on the lentil. Of course, Jesus uh, was Mary's firstborn son and her only born son in Catholic theology. Uh, and, and you actually see that noted, I believe, in Luke 2, that Mary's firstborn son uh, so, you know, you're getting back to that whole idea about the firstborn sons of the Passover. And then Jesus, uh, whose legs are not broken, who is without blemish, just like the lamb, uh, yields up his spirit after saying, it is finished. 
Now, the, the actual best translation of that is it is accomplished, not, you know, a lot of people take it as a, as a cry of despair, oh, you know, I'm dead, it's finished, it's all over. No, the, the better translation is it is accomplished, it is complete. Sort of like what? The end of the Passover Seder. That Jesus himself, the spilling of his blood, is the fourth cup. So, if you follow that idea, the Seder of the Last Supper and the crucifixion are the same thing. They're, they're not two different things. They are one and the same. A hand? Yeah, if I could just add Please. real quick into uh, Right before he says it is finished and right before he drinks the sour wine from the hyssop branch, he says, um, I thirst. So all that time, like he's in pain, he's been thirsty, he's been thirsty. Mm -hmm. Then he said, in fact, it all... Um, when they're all doing the Passover feast, he said, I won't drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Yes. Right. So. And so then, when he's up on there, after he's gone through the whole thing, at the very, very end, he says, I thirst. And that's when they finally raise the fourth cup to hit the sour wine on the hyssop branch. Hyssop branch is the branch they use to do the blood on the doorpost. And then he drinks it. And right after he drinks it, he says, it's finished. Yes. So that's the new right. covenant. Okay. To repeat that for the mic, uh, Jesus says at the very end of the crucifixion, I thirst, even though he's undoubtedly been thirsty the whole time, uh, which at that point the Romans produce the, the sour wine on the hyssop. Uh, he drinks that and then immediately says it is finished, thus ending the Seder. So uh, the Seder is all about sacrifice. It's all about bloody sacrifice. Jesus is offering himself as a bloody sacrifice. Uh, this is... This is the new Passover. This is a way of making things right. It would seem if you follow this idea that Christ's death is central. It's not just his life, as, as the earlier ideas said. It's not just his life, but it's especially his passion and his death that somehow bring about this atonement. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, that's a very important point, and if I don't come back to that in a few minutes, I want you to say it again, because that, that's a, a point that is of crucial importance that is sometimes, and what I'm about to tell you, is often overlooked. So the idea that comes from this, that, that Jesus' spilling of blood is, is the thing that is making us right with God, there are a couple of theories. One is the ransom theories, that, or the ransom theory, the Christus Victor theory, that when we disobeyed God, we fell into the clutches. We leaped into the clutches of Satan. And now somebody's got to get us out. And we can't really do that for ourselves uh, because we're, we're caught in a trap. So Jesus' death uh, is essentially paying off Satan. It's paying a ransom to Satan uh, and therefore freeing us from Satan's grasp. Now, in some ways, that's helpful. It's, it's like the metaphors of the Trinity. Uh, metaphors can be helpful as long as you don't take them too, too far, because they all fail if you take them too far. This ransom theory is much the same way. Uh, it's helpful to understand a little bit, because we're certainly in Satan's clutches, and God is freeing us from Satan's clutches. You don't want to take it so far as you know, Christ paying a ransom because that implies that Satan has some sort of legitimate claim to us. And I'm not sure that that's really a very good idea. Uh, yes? Well, that's, a, that's, yeah, that's the third way that, that we... We have to satisfy God's justice, and that's another one I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the problem with the ransom theory, you know, once again, I have to slip into legal speak, that if you are seeking justice and fairness from a court, a basic rule is you've got to have clean hands yourself. You can't have been unjust during this transaction and then come in and demand that the court show you justice. Well, nothing Satan did to human beings was just. He, he tricked us. Uh, unless you believe in double predestination, 
Uh, you, you really can't say that what Satan did was in accordance with God's will. God allowed it, but he certainly didn't want it. He didn't ordain it. Satan tricked us into, uh, into betraying God. And therefore, he doesn't have any legitimate claim to any kind of ransom. Uh, you know, this, this is not a legal deal between God and Satan. That raises the, the idea that God and Satan, you know, the little angel and the little demon, you know, there's, there's the good God who we call God, and there's the bad God that we call Satan, and they're engaged in a tug of war over human souls. No, God created Satan. God allows Satan to exist. If God stopped thinking about Satan for a heartbeat, Satan would cease to exist. God's in control of everything. So Satan does not have any kind of claim on God. That's the main problem with the ransom theory. But you know, the idea that Satan does have us in thrall somehow, and something has to be done to, to get us out of that thrall, that, that certainly works. And, and that seems to be tied in to the spilling of Christ's blood. Now the variation on that, and this is one that, that Jerry was getting to, is that it isn't uh, Satan to whom the debt has to be paid, it is God himself in his infinite justice. And that's, that makes a little bit more sense, uh, but it has to be understood correctly. Uh, the, the person who first best put this was St. Anselm, who was Archbishop of Canterbury, about a thousand years ago. Uh, actually make that 900 years ago. And he was the first of uh, who were called the scholastics or the schoolmen, who took a very scholarly, logical, almost a hyperlogical approach to, uh, to the faith. And one of Anselm's writings was in Latin, Cur Deus Homo, which literally means why the God-man. And, you know, God-man is actually a good description of Jesus. He is God, he is man. Um, and, and he took this view that, that a debt is owed to God. Now, we all owe God everything. Adam and Eve owed God everything. Uh, they owed him for their very existence, for the food he provided, for the air they breathed, for the water they drank, for their continued to life. They owed him everything. So, if they transgressed and held something back, which they did when they ate the forbidden fruit, how do they pay that back? Well, they can't pay him back with other things they may have because those other things are also owed to God. There is nothing they can do to pay God back. It's completely beyond their power. Well, you have to find somebody who has not fallen into sin to pay God back and to, to pay God back on behalf of human beings. Well, an angel might work for that uh, because the angels are without sin and they are you know, that, that works. Um, as a matter of fact, and I'm not sure that Anselm said this, uh, it's, it's been a while since I actually read Curtis Homo cover to cover. I think it's been almost 30 years. So I read the cliff notes today, sorry. Um, I, I suppose you could even say the Blessed Virgin Mary might work because Christ preserved her from sin from the very beginning. Uh, she's the one person other than Christ himself who is without sin. Um, but that's not through her own merit. That's because Christ saved her. But there are problems with that. There are problems with having the angel step in. There's a problem with having Mary step in. Because the angels and Mary are mere creatures. And that would make us somehow subservient or beholden to a creature. And that's a problem. You have to have it be God himself. And yet, if this person is going to stand in our shoes, he's also got to be a human being. Therefore, you have to have a human being who is completely without sin, um, who can pay what is effectively an infinite debt on behalf of others. And that's Christ Jesus, God who is man. Now, the reason I said why you have to understand this correctly is because this does make God, if you think about it incorrectly, seem like this very bloody-minded uh, uh, God or deity who is interested in nothing but blood propitiation of his justice. 
And that's pretty grim. Now, there is some truth in that. Once again, as we point out, God is infinitely just. We have to make ourselves right, or somebody has to make things right with him. That's just the way it is. You know, he, he didn't make us sin. He didn't start this game. We are the ones who chose, chose the rules. He's now just holding us to the rules. So you, you can see that this, this demand of justice is a real one. And it's one that is very often overlooked today. You know, that God is just. If you read the Nicene Creed very carefully, it points out that he shall come again in glory to forgive the living and the dead. No, does it say that? Yeah, we're going to be judged. All right? Um, but who made the decision to become a human being and to voluntarily undergo a sacrificial death? God himself did that for us. All right? That that is, that is, a, gift, that is a selfless gift of love. God didn't have to do that. You know, God could have left all of us to burn in hell. That's entirely up to him. So, so when you're thinking about this horrible, bloody God that demands the spilling of blood, remember whose blood it is being spilled. It's God's own blood. And he, as a gift of love, decided to do that for you, to save you, when you cannot save yourself. And I think that's what Jerry was getting at a few moments ago. So. Some of those Mm -hmm. Right. Which goes back to my statement about fulfilling the covenant. If you want something done right, you've got to do it yourself. It's only God who can do it. Um, now, Peter Abelard, who was a rough contemporary of Anselm, uh, reacted a little too strongly against that and you know, more to the loving God and less to the just God and said the way that that atonement happens is just by Jesus leading the perfectly obedient life, which in fact he did. And that obedience led him to a sacrificial death on the cross. And if you think about it in Western civilization, and probably in other civilizations as well, what is the greatest thing anybody can do for anybody else? Throw himself on a hand grenade for another person. I mean, you don't have to be a Christian to accept the, that depth and that degree of sacrifice. Christ himself points out with that. You know, Greater love hath no man done for another than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. So Christ, in addition to that, uh, in, in, in making this blood sacrifice, in being the Lamb of the New Testament, uh, you know, when, when John Baptist sees him, what does he say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You hear that upstairs lately? Yeah, at, at the beginning, you know, at, at every Mass. Um, so in addition to being this lamb whose blood is spilled, that Christ does set the example to us of, of being perfectly obedient to God's will all the way up to death on a cross. So my advice to you is don't, don't try to figure out the exact means by which Christ atones for all human sin. Uh, that all of these ways have some merit to them in understanding them. Uh, and yet it's not entirely perfect. There are a few other things you have to remember. Uh, one thing you have to remember is that we are called upon to, uh, and I believe this is St. Paul, I can't remember which book, to make up in our own bodies what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Now, Christ is God. What could possibly be lacking in his sufferings? Uh, his sufferings were, were infinite, in a sense. He took all the sins, all the pain of the world on him during, during his passion and death. Well, what's lacking is our, our own buying into that suffering, our own acceptance of that. Um, and uh, once again, to go to law, um, the law of gifts. If I am to give you something, there have got to be three elements to it. First of all, I have to intend to give you something. Think about this. That's a something. Secondly, I've got to deliver it. And thirdly, you've got to accept it. It's toxic waste. <laughs> yes. Now, what if I, how about, and you have to, and these things have to coincide. What if I lend that to him? It's, it's a book. That, that book has got my latest bestseller in it. 
and he takes it home and he reads it, but it's alone. And he comes back in a week and says, you know, that is a terrific book. And I say, well, it's yours now. Keep it. So you see how the delivery took place first. And then a week later, the intent took place. And then, then presumably the acceptance. So God intends to make this gift of redemption to us. He does, in fact, deliver the goods in the person of himself. What do we have to do? We have to accept it. You know, we're not doing anything to save ourselves. You know, a lot of, thank you, um, a, a lot of Protestants believe that Catholics believe that they are saved through works. Uh, Father, uh, Father Justin Ferguson, who was our paro parochial vicar until a few months ago, he loved to tell this story that you know, he told somebody he was a Catholic priest, and he said, and, and the person he was talking said, oh, you believe in works, don't you? <laughs> well, yeah, we do believe in works. Uh, we don't believe we're saved by them. We're saved by God's gift of himself, God's grace. But we have to accept that grace, and we accept that grace in two ways. First of all, by having faith, and secondly, by performing good works. I mean, that's, that's part of the package. Uh, it's a gift, okay? You don't earn a gift, but we have to at least accept the gift. Uh, so, so works are important uh, for, for Catholics. Remember what Christ said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That sounds like you've got to do something to me. Hmm? Faith without works is dead. That's another one. So you do have to do something. Uh, you, you have to make up. You, 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 have to, you have to add yourself into the mix. Uh, and that's very important. Uh, so uh, so that, that's part of it. But, we, but that's worthless without Christ's sacrifice and giving of himself to us. Now, a few other things. We'll go back to this whole Passover Seder. And you remember how I was talking about the Baraka prayer? And this is that's an easy name to remember because our current president, Barack Obama, his first name actually has the same linguistic, linguistic root uh, as Baraka. Uh, it's, a, it's essentially a Hebrew word. Um, and it, it means remembering the first Passover. And that's what we do, right? Do this in memory of me. We remember what happened back then, right? wrong. It's, it's not remembering something that happened back then. Uh, the, the proper understanding of it is, uh, both in the Passover Seder and in the Mass, remember that you are part of this story. You see the difference in that? How many Southerners do we have in here? Okay, most of us. Okay, I'm going to give you something and, and this resonates most with Southerners, and particularly Southern whites. It probably resonates with Southern blacks in a very different way, and actually a negative way. But I think it's something that Southerners will instinctively understand. And if you understand this, you will understand the relationship between the Last Supper, the crucifixion the next day, and every single Mass that has ever been said or will be said. Uh, this is the... Uh, a passage from Intruder in the Dust, which is a William Faulkner novel. And he is talking about the Battle of Gettysburg. And this is a very Southern Gothic moment, the idea that the South can't really escape its own history. And I want you to notice how what's going on in this passage is not remembering what happened 80 years ago at Gettysburg. It's, it's making Gettysburg the present. And I'll see if I can do it. It's all now you see. Yesterday won't begin until tomorrow, and tomorrow began 10,000 years ago. For every southern boy 14 years old, not once, but whenever he wants it, it's still not yet 2 o'clock on that hot July afternoon, and the guns are laid and ready, and the troops are in the woods, and Pickett himself, with his long oiled ringlets, and his hat in one hand probably, and his sword in the other, looking up the hill, waiting for Longstreet to give the word. And it hasn't happened yet. It's all in the balance. It hasn't even begun yet. There is still time for it not to happen. In that place, and in those circumstances, which made more men than Garnett and Wilcox and Kemper and Armistead look grave, yet it's going to happen. We all know that. 
we have traveled too far and come too far and traveled too long, and it doesn't even take a 14-year-old boy to think, this time, maybe this time, with all this much to gain and all this much to lose. Pennsylvania, Maryland, the Golden Dome of Washington itself to crown with desperate and unbelievable glory the cast made two years ago. Or to anyone who has sailed out onto the ocean and open raft to think, this is it. The moment to turn back now or sail on inevitably over the world's roaring rim. There was a time when the war wasn't lost, that moment just before Pickett's charge. And we now today in the South are living with the repercussions of that charge. We can't escape it. It's part of who we are. If, if God had been a Southerner, that, would, that passage would be the words of institution, okay, for better or worse. Do you understand now when the priest says, this is my body, it's making Christ present? You are actually there in the presence of cavalry, cavalry, excuse me, Confederate cavalry. Yeah. <laughs> you are also there in the upper room for the Last Supper. You know, Catholics do something really wild with time. They annihilate it. We step out of time and into the presence of eternity, just like the Last Supper, just like the crucifixion. So you understand now the link between that Seder and the Last Supper and the Mass. And maybe now you can accept the real presence a little bit more readily as well. Because what did they have to do when they killed the lamb and splattered its blood everywhere? They had to eat it. They had to eat the lamb. That's part of entering the covenant. Uh, you know, not a symbolic lamb, not an, not an animal. You actually have to partake of the lamb. The only way we can do that or keep the feast, as St. Paul says, uh, Christ has been sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast, let us enter into that Passover Seder, is to actually consume the lamb. Not a representation, but the real thing. And the way you do that is to step out of time and into the presence of Calvary. And in doing that, we achieve communion with God, union with God and with each other. So, uh, somewhere in there, our atonement is achieved. Now, quick word about resurrection. Uh, I'm going to try to leave a little time for questions. Quick word about resurrection. That's important for several reasons. First of all, it's, it, it's a witness to the power of God, the saving power of God. Uh, secondly, if you read the accounts carefully, Christ has a human body, but it's a glorified body. It's perhaps the type of body that Adam and Eve had before the fall. And that shows us where we are headed if we do, in fact, keep that Passover covenant. That a human being is not a soul trapped in a space suit that happens to be organic. A human being is a union of soul and body. Death is defined as the moment when the soul and the body are no longer together. Well, the resurrection, the soul and the body are brought back together. And you see this in Jewish history. Uh, it takes a while to develop. It develops over time. But uh, the book of Maccabees, forget which book of Maccabees, but uh, one, of, one of the people in the book of Maccabees says, God gave me these hands and this body, and I hope to get them back on the last day. Uh, in the New Testament, when Jesus uh, goes to the tomb of Lazarus and he says to, to Mary, do you believe he'll rise again? And she says, yes, I believe he'll rise again on the last day. Uh, so you see by that point the idea of a resurrection at the last day, a reunion of the soul and the physical body are, are starting to become part of mainstream Judaism. Uh, but Jesus actually shows us what it will be like and, and what is to result from that. Uh, well, what about people who have long since been dead, they've dissolved into ash, they've been nuked, they've been lost at the bottom of the sea? Well, you know, that's why it's called a miracle. With God, nothing's impossible. All right? We get it all back, but it's going to be glorified. And so we, we see something of that in the resurrection, that um, that, that really restores us fully to, uh, to the grace of God. So, uh, there you have it, whirlwind tour of the passion and death and the saving work of Christ. Uh, and I will now turn it over to you all to ask me questions and play Stump the Chump. We all like Stump the Chump. <laughs> Not sure if we like the chump, but you know, we like stumping him. So, fire away.
all go that present and calm. Okay. Father just told me one time that how to when you when you kind of do the root uh, the okay, you kind of do the rosary. He said that one way of contemplation was tell me if this sounds like what you're saying was to put yourself in the time of the Calvary and and see it well but when in the agony of God were you the rock? Were you whatever and, and what were you doing? Mm-hmm. Not quite, I don't think. The question is that uh, Father Justin once said that when you're saying the rosary, you should imagine yourself, for instance, back in Gethsemane, uh, because it make I, I imagine because it would make things more real. It would it would you know focus you. Um, I, I think that's a good mental exercise. I don't think that you know that you actually step out of time and into eternity in that circumstance, um, the way you do at the mass. Uh, and actually, if you want to take it a little bit farther, that and, and this is coming from Scott Hahn once again, I think he has a, a good way of doing it, that not only is the Last Supper and the Crucifixion and the Mass, not only are all these three the same, one and the same thing, they're also one and the same with uh, the Book of Revelation, which really describes the liturgy of the Mass uh, in a very heavily symbolic way, if you think about it, at the end of time. So it's all about the coming of the kingdom of God. Uh, what you, tell me again, it is finished. Uh, I will not drink. Uh, yeah, I, will, I will not yet drink again of the fruit of the vine until, until my kingdom. Until I drink it with you again in, in, the, kingdom. in the kingdom. Yeah, so the kingdom has come. Yeah, you know, a lot of people, we get a lot of heretical hymns. Uh, in the last 20 or 30 years, because you've got bad liturgists and bad hymnodists. How many of y'all, you know, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me? <laughs> begin with me. Yeah, it's all about me. Yeah, it, it, I think it began when the Prince of Peace was, you know, became incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and if not then, certainly when he w died on the cross. Yeah, the, the, ba the best way to tell a bad hymn is it's all about us. Okay, it's, you know, I'm sorry, it just is. Okay, so, um, anyway, but yeah, so the, the king, the, the Last Supper, the life of Christ, the crucifixion, the book of Revelation, it's all about the coming of the kingdom, the perfection of the kingdom of God. We're not building the kingdom, it's already here. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's inside you. You know, all you have to do is, is accept it, uh, accept the gift, and, and you yeah. know. This, this might help a little bit. The way it was explained to me when I first went through confirmation, when I was trying to, when you were trying to explain to me how God exists outside of um, time, and how the Eucharist and God can be present now, just as it was back when Jesus first made the sacrifice, and is equally present in all the Eucharist in the future that will ever be. Like He's present there right now at all of them. If you if you think of your your life. It's like a line on a piece of paper. So you make decisions, and like you have decisions, and this is your life. God would be the piece of paper. He's present at the day that you were born. He's present at the day that you die. And he's present at every single point along your entire life, all at once. So if you think about the whole history of the world, that's God is there at all times. Just, it's all now. So that when Eucharist. Jesus was sacrificed. He, he sacrificed then. It's the same time every time at the mass. It's, it's your, I don't know. It's 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 like the Matrix or something. Yeah. It's mind bending. Uh, a similar one to that. I never heard that one. I'm gonna steal that one. Uh, is the Father Ben version? Uh, you're standing by the railroad tracks and a very long train comes by. You experience each box car at a discrete moment in time. God is up in the air. That's where God is, right? He's always up. Yeah, God's up there somewhere. He's looking down. He sees the entire train as a whole simultaneously. Uh, it's, it's a, we can sort of get our hands around the idea, the heads around the idea that God created space. Big Bang, universe, all that, right? 
it's a little bit harder to get our heads around the idea that God created time. Okay, that before there was time, there was God. Because how do you tell that time's passing, if you think about it? The only way you can tell time's passing is through physical change. You know, if, if, there's, if there's no matter and there's no change, there's no time. There just is God. So. I, I was just going to ask, I, I wonder if uh, time itself is essentially a human construct. <laughs> well, <laughs> or a human, I, I don't, I'm searching for a word here, but something that lacks in divinity. Well, it is certainly, uh, apparently from our perspective, it's certainly subjective. I mean, Einstein has, has pretty much proved that in, I think, 1919. Uh, now, of course, Einsteinian theory may have had a hole blown in it because they've just found some muons that, that travel faster than light. Maybe. So stay tuned. <laughs> but, but yeah, but yeah, it is a, but passage of time is a subjective thing. And this is interesting because uh, eternity doesn't mean forever. It doesn't mean time going on forever. It means absence of time. It means everything is, is in the present, in a sense. I mean, is that mind-bending or what? We really ought to be, this, this ought to be Eastern thought or something, the, like the Eastern thing. Church. Right. It is. Right. That's, That's probably the best yeah. concept that we would say. I think you're right. I mean, I do, I do think that Einsteinian physics help us understand a little bit more how subjective and relative we are uh, as opposed to the absolute that is God and that we can never full, you know, we can never fully grasp that. I mean maybe some of the most brilliant of us can, can understand the universe in a mathematically abstract way but my clip fell off. My clip fell off. You're, you're, you're all doomed. You're not going to be able to hear the rest of this. I'm sorry. So, um, but once again, it's, it's like any other analogy. It is useful, but it is not perfect. You know, the train analogy is, is useful, but not perfect, because the train is still moving in time, you know, even though God's looking down seeing. But it helps. Uh, it, it helps. I think if you get enough analogies for something, you can shoot around it. None of the analogies hit perfectly, but they can give you an outline by you know, showing you things. So, uh, Next question, yes. couple of different ways in this class and talking with others, I'm beginning to grasp the idea that any kind of faith that I have is grace that God gives me. Yes. You cannot believe of your own will. That Even the faith is, is a work, if you will, that is enabled by God giving you the grace to, to have faith. And, and part of my very simple out view of what, I, what the heck I'm doing right now with all this is I just come to class on Thursday. I read my book, I come to class. And that's my role and I feel like there's supposed to be something more I should do, or maybe I'm too gung ho, and it's hard for me to figure out the balance of, you know, what am I supposed to do? You know, if, it's, if God gives it all to me, then am I just, I don't know what to do. I'd say think about it and pray about it. Uh, that there were, there were many disciples at first. I mean, the most best known were the twelve. And they... As, as was the case of, of Israel as a whole, came to gradual awareness. It was a process. They came to a gradual awareness of who Christ was. Uh, you know, only one of them got blown off his horse. You know, St. Paul and, you know, you know, the thunder and the lightning and the, the sort of conversion experience that we as Southerners tend to think about. That was the exception. Most of them had to think and struggle and you know, do this, and, and, and it, was a, you know, it was a gradual learning thing. So, uh, so don't try to rush it. You know, think about it. Do, do as the Blessed Virgin Mary did. She pondered these things in her heart. Uh, ultimately, there's nothing you have to do. Uh, you know, there, there have been many people that, that have undergone deathbed baptisms. That's, that's just a free, you know, no first confession, no living a Christ-like life. You're baptized, you're saved, you die, you go to heaven. You know, so it's not about earning anything, but it is about responding to what you believe to be God telling you in, in some way. And Jerry has a thought.
our hearts and let him in, he begins working on him then. Because we have free will. We can do what we want, you know. Uh, we can even hold him out at times. But if we willingly let him in, he can begin moving our hearts to give us greater understanding, greater wisdom, greater fullness of joy, greater peace. Just like Peter, I mean, almost to the very end, you know. I mean, Lord told him, you know, kind of say, uh, and then he denies and get downstairs in, in, in the pilot's uh, uh, sanctuary where, he, where they're, they're giving Jesus a rough, rough time and they're squatting him and slapping him and what have you. And they're over there and they sign and Peter's in there at the bar and three people come up to him and say, aren't you one? And he says, no. And then when Jesus turns around and looks at him, as he said for the last time, I do not know you. Uh, Peter receives some from them, and he runs out crying and bawling because he knows he rejected someone who he could love. He loved. And that love grows even as he watches him go to the cross. Does any of that? Does any of that help at all? You, you still look. No, I'm glad to be listening now. I'm okay. I'm well, let's talk some afterwards. I, 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 let's, you know, we've got about five more minutes, four more, and then let's talk a bit after. I think what you're asking yes. is a little bit more subtle than that. I think what you're asking is if it's all based on faith, then once you have earned, have gotten or received the gift of faith, why do you do anything beyond that? Is that what you're asking? I guess that I just want to be responsible. I don't know what literally like, you know, okay, it's Monday morning. But what do I do today to do God's will? Oh, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, and that is, you know, that comes down to Catholic social teaching. Uh, I mean, you say prayer and meditation, and then there's do your works. And oh, really? You know, probably those. Wait around and accept it. Well, really, the simplest way to do it, the simplest way to put it is the way God put it. You know, love, love God with all your soul, all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbors yourself. And remember their love, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, we have this very nasty, ugly habit, which is, which is pushed on us by the secular world, and especially Hollywood and secular America, that love is an emotion, it's how you feel. You know, I love, oh, I love this banana split. I just, you know, it's just, no, love, love is a decision of the will, okay? What is the greatest act of love you have that, that has ever taken place in the history of human beings okay yeah it's the crucifixion and and he's as he's there on the cross he's going I just love you all so much I just love you this is this is giving me such warm fuzzy feelings to have these nails ripping my tendons and bones you know that's love it's a choice it is an action it is certainly not an emotion Jesus was almost definitely not feeling warm fuzzies while he was you know being killed in one of the most gruesome manners possible. Uh, so you want, uh, it, and love especially is to will and to see to the good of the beloved before you see to your own good. In big ways, in small ways, you know, if a, if a guy's trying to get in at the busy intersection, you let him in as long as you, you're not going to cause, cause a 12-car pile up doing it. Uh, you yeah. know, Now you don't don't listen to Jerry. We're Catholics. We are not allowed to read the Bible, okay? And if we find out you own one, we're gonna we're gonna take it. And we're gonna hurt you. Yeah. No. Actually, yes. Catholics, and 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 we'll get into you know we'll get into indulgences and stuff like that later. But you, you actually earn indulgences for um, for reading Scripture. Yeah. Uh, Fifteen minutes a day is it? If you can do that. Ten minutes a day. Uh, if you're gonna read one verse a day. You know, start small. 
Um, that's very good. But, but prayer, um, uh, good works to other people, big ones, small ones, uh, Christian charity. Um, I won't say social justice. I hate the phrase social justice. I think it's a horrible thing and for a lot of reasons. We, I'm sorry, we are not going to achieve justice on this planet in this life. All right? We, we need to try to be just as often as possible and to love our neighbor and to see to the good and welfare of our neighbor over and above our own good. But that's different from achieving social justice. Ain't gonna have, that's what, called, what is called Catholic social teaching. So prayer, uh, life in the sacraments, read scripture, do good for other people. That's, that's really what it boils down to. If I could just add one thing, it's, it's a lot of little things too. If the purpose of life is to live for the glory of God, you can glorify God just like little things like smiling at somebody and walking out to your car. Mm -hmm. Just trying to live with that joyfulness that when people look at you they say, what does that person have that I don't have? And just trying to do the little things that glorify God. Being an example of God just in your daily actions where you direct yourself towards that a little extra mile and work and everything. It's like all the little stuff. Yes. The, oh, yeah, the little, the little flower. Um, uh, St. Therese of Lisieux, who is one of the most beloved of the saints, uh, she lived about 120, 130 years ago, and she, in her, her autobiography, she wrote about what she called her little way. Uh, little works of love for people who didn't feel they were capable of heroic virtue. Uh, and she is one of the doctors of the church and a great saint. And, uh, there is a statue of her upstairs back in that corner. So, uh, but it's a, uh, I mean, it, it, there's, a, you know, you had, it, there's a lot to learn about the Christian life uh, and to follow the precepts of the church. Uh, if nothing else, common decency. Uh, according to uh, Hillel and, and Talmud, uh, you know, that's, that's most of what Jewish life is, is just